Hello, everyone. Welcome to the March meeting of our Health InfoNet Behavioral Health Information Technology Reimbursement Initiative. Um, we really want to thank you for coming and participating today. My name is Gemma, and I am the Behavioral Health Program Coordinator at Health InfoNet and the chairperson for today's call today's webinar. Before we get started, um, we're going to just look at our, um, it's not moving, there we go. Just um, some of our housekeeping rules as always. We have muted all of you. You can still ask questions. Please participate by using the chat in the corner. We will have a question and answer at the end of all of our presentations today. So um, make sure you keep your questions in mind. So today we have a really wonderful lineup. We have two spectacular nurses on the call today that are going to share with us some of the secrets behind their behavioral health home success. So today we have Shelley Thibodeau, who's joining us from Assistance Plus, and Liz Mann, who is joining us from the Opportunity Alliance. And we're so um, grateful that you have taken the time today to, um, to do these presentations for us. Following our, um, our presentation from Liz and Shelley, Katie Sensei, who is the program director that we all, um, we all are following here in the SIM grant, will be talking about the new HIN partnership with Maincare and Kipro. So, and again, we will be doing questions and answers following all of the presentations. And we have a lot to cover, so we're, we're going to, um, to move on. I'm going to start with Shelley. And I'm um, really so privileged to have Shelley, Shelley here today. Um, Assistance Plus has consistently been one of the highest utilizers of the Health Infinite Clinical Portal. And um, a lot of what's been driving the success of their behavioral health home has been using the clinical portal. And Shelley's going to tell us more about that. And so, Shelley, first, why don't you begin and give us sort of an outline of your behavioral health home structure. Hi, Gemma. Thank you. Uh, we actually have, I forgot to mention, we have a clinician at the top of the program. We have two nurses, Melanie and Mike. Uh, Mike is part-time. He's retired, semi-retired. We have roughly 11 case managers. We have peer staff, and we actually have two program managers. This, this is all part of the BHH program. And how many peer staff do you have? We have two peer staff. Okay, okay. And, um, and you also share that in, in common with the TOA that you don't have access to Health Infonet for the peer staff? No, not at all. Okay. No, the peer staff are uh, basically one-on-one -on -one with the clients that we work with. So, um, the health net is important for us. The case managers upload their clients into the uh, portal, and it just is great communication if um, clients have gone into the hospital, had an ED visit. The pro one of the primary goals of the BHH program is reducing um, ER visits, unnecessary ER visits. So the case managers oftentimes will have uh, notifications in the morning if the clients they're working with have been in the ER or admitted into the hospital. And this allows good communication together. For me as a nurse, um, I can inspect the medical side and see what pieces I can help out with and contacting the primary care physician in the case managers, it allows them to get a jump start on helping the client um, in, in the times that they are uh, not well, which, which is quite nice. 
And, you know, I, I just want to jump in because one of the things that you talked about on the phone with me uh, just a couple of times, and we've heard it from Doris Skarka, and we'll be hearing it from Liz later, but um, that you actually do a lot of face-to-face. -face. You'll jump in. Your office is very close to where the case managers are and that you'll be running in on the day room there to check on them, seeing if they need a hand. So there's a lot of back and forth. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's it's actually pretty convenient. The uh, to get to my office, I actually have to walk through what they call the day room, and the case managers are generally in there, and uh, so it's nice. I, I can hear who's out there, or if I walk through in the morning, it gives a good opportunity while they're fresh on the computer and looking things up, for us just to have a minute to chat about clients and and problem solve a lot of. A lot of the problem solving actually happens at, at those times, uh, or they'll come in my office and uh, we'll talk and come up with a plan. It makes it so much easier just being close to one another. Because yeah, the really, goal, yeah. really helps with the communication. It sure does, yeah. So, yeah, and, yeah, and you want to talk a little bit about how important it is for them to have access to Health Intronet. Yeah, when they do the 90, have 90 day reviews that they're, um, that each client has. And so oftentimes it's nice being linked up with a health info net because as we know with clientele that we work with, cell phones change uh, pretty, pretty quickly or often and uh, providers change for their you know, primary care providers, addresses. Whoever is linked into the health info net, that information is uploaded pretty consistently. So that's been really helpful, not only for us, but for case managers. If, they, uh, if there's changes and somebody adds it in there, we can get a hold of the client a lot quicker. Uh, and uh, for me as a nurse, the health info net, just the medications, being able to review the medications, allergies. Uh, we often can get medical diagnoses, read what the uh, primary care physician or the uh, ER doc wrote on the discharge. So we know what their plan is as well. So we can, can have continuity of care. You, you have mentioned before about how you can sometimes go in and when you look and see this data, you can kind of know what the clinicians who are prescribing are thinking. It gives you a it, bigger picture. Exactly. And what also is nice is it will show what medications have been refilled and where. So it's a great way to detect if someone is consistent taking meds or if they're sporadically refilling the medications. Uh, we have the dates right on the health info net, and that has really helped uh, troubleshoot and and help. It's a great teaching moment for clients. So I I want you to go through for us. I, you're so clear about your workflow, and I think that um, if you could share a little bit about that with us, it can be helpful to some of those on the call who are trying to maximize their own usage of the tools that they have available to meet client needs. So um, let's take a look at um, at what you do. That you said that in the mor what you do in the morning. We have a few slides here, really just around your workflow. So let's look at that. Sure, absolutely. And first thing in the morning, um, I come in and chat with the case managers and uh, get an idea if they need a hand or uh, if something's happened with clients that we work together with. Secondly, uh, Melanie and I, the, uh, the other nurse, we actually go through the health info uh, tags, emails that we receive, and we decipher if the client is still in the hospital, if they've been discharged, and why they were actually in the ED. And uh, it allows us to get a hold of the case manager, follow through with the case manager, call the client, call the primary care physician, and um, it generally ends up just being better extended care after the ED visit. 
And then you, you said that after, on a typical day, after you would do that in review, then you would see your scheduled clients, which is probably a large part of your day. Uh, and then you go back and forth between VMS and Health InfoNet. So why don't you talk us through what that is like for you? Sure. I've included in the webinar a sheet that I had made up. How we are rated um, with Main Care, the BHH program, is through the VMS. The VMS is asking uh, us to complete if clients are diabetic. They have four things uh, that we need to make sure we're compliant on making sure that the client is having preventative care done. Easy ones for me to see is uh, A1 or LDLs. So I go back from the VMS to the HIN, and I'm able to see when the last LDL, when the last A1C was completed, and if it's if it hasn't been done in over a year, then I write out a fax, send the fax to the primary care physician's office explaining who we are and why we're asking for this to be done. And uh, it just really makes the communication so much easier. And again, it's preventative health care for folks who aren't always um, able to advocate for themselves. So. The crosswalk, the VMS and the HIN crosswalk, is crucial to our rating, being sure that we complete that and get our hands and eyes on every client that we serve on a medical capacity. Yeah, and um, you you actually moved up your your uh, status. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that might be of interest to people on the call as well. Sure. When I first came into this position, it, the VMS was very overwhelming. And uh, if you look on the quality dashboard on the VMS, there's several um, ID measure descriptions that they want us to complete with each client. So I first started with A1Cs and LDLs. It seemed the simplest to me. So I went through 350 some odd of our clients and I ensured that each client had either their LDL or A1C or both completed. And the ones who didn't, I again, I sent a fax to the primary care physician. Um, so when we were audited, we actually went from improver to achiever, or vice versa, achiever to improver. And that was, gosh, I'd say a 20-page um, audit on my part that I had proof and, and showing main care, hey, look, I, I reached out, I've requested this, and um, either if, if they weren't done, either the CP uh, didn't get the facts or the client just didn't want the, the lab orders drawn. But it afforded the, uh, the follow through, what's required through the VMS. Okay. So I started with that and then I, I printed off the VMS, the rules and uh, regs and what they were asking for and I broke it down kind of went through it with a fine tooth comb and I made that cheat sheet per se. And it's pretty simple, it's a yes, no uh, cheat sheet. And it, it's a real time saver and, um, and again, compliancy with main care to me is a, a big deal. So we want to make sure we do the best service we can for these clients. Yeah, thank you. And I, I want to tell everyone on the call that um, Shelly, and I know, Shelly, you mentioned this, but I did send out with today's PowerPoint a template that Shelly put together for all of you that you can do this too. Um, and, and it also includes another template that, that Shelly will be talking about in just a couple of minutes. Um, so Shelly, let's just look at the lessons learned so far you know, from what you've been talking about. Um, 
you, you um, sort of were looking at what, one of the things on our list of lessons learned, uh, and we didn't go through this, so I thought maybe we might spend a minute talking about the curious piece. It pays to be curious because you, um, you have found going into Health InfoNet that it's helpful for you to keep your client in, in mind. Can you talk a little bit, a bit about that and how the data comes to life for you because you employ really this curious mindset? Sure, absolutely. Um, the Health Info Net can be pretty intimidating. There's a lot of information. Um, again, it's pragmatic. It's all numbers uh, on the labs, so we know what we're looking for, what we need to see, and um, really what we want to see as, as nurses. And so it allows for a great way to put together a story of the client. Um, and again, seeing clients face to face and, and pulling this up, it uh, it really encompasses every bit of their their healthcare. I I feel so. Labs are pretty self-explanatory. The outpatient visits are the greatest for me because I can get in and see what the the uh, primary care physician is is thinking and what goals they have in mind. Uh, not everybody has that particular tab, but most of our patients do. Um, the emergency room visits are absolutely necessary. And um, so it took really a lot of time. And thankfully, my employer, uh, Assistance Plus, has been great. They, they allowed me the time to poke around and look and explore. And just be curious with this website without being intimidated uh, because it's really, it's just like sitting down with a medical chart, what they did 20 years ago, and it's right at our fingertips. Yes, well done, well said. Um, I just had a question come through which goes really nicely with um, your next piece. And so the question came through and I, I, uh, I just want to raise it. How do you get the PCPs to run the lab by fax? What did you say to them? Send them. I've already felt some resistance with this. And I think that you can address this right on this slide. Oh, sure. Here's the thing. Um, we know most of the doctors that or doctor's offices that we work with, um, there's a lot out there, but you'll have your top 10 uh, that your, most of your clients go to. Uh, Melanie and I make it a point to stop into the doctor's offices and we actually introduce ourselves to the nurses, nurse care managers, medical assistants. Those are our go-to people. I mean, the primary care physician has a lot on their plate. so. Once there's a relationship built up and it's been a, a, a couple face-to-face, -face, handshake, hey, this is what we're doing, it does require explanation because, quite frankly, providers are just limited on time. So I utilize the MAs, nurse care managers, uh, their liaisons to improve communication and it really ultimately benefits the client. It takes a little bit of time and uh, being personable with these folks. However, it's, it's really paid off. Um, in the cases where the primary care physician is absolutely resistant on uh, lab work, that's the time where I actually will take a minute and mail out a letter uh, explaining exactly what program, the BHHO program, and what they are looking for. And if they are a provider with a program, it's, it's really goes hand in hand and I'm trying to save the provider time. And uh, so that's usually received fairly well. But again, it's relationship building. Yes, and, and um, I do, I do want to add right here, Shelley, that that's the other template that, we, that Shelley sent to us is this letter. So it's, a very, it's done some really great warming of relationships for Shelley, and she wanted to share that with you, too. So thank you, Shelley, for being so generous with these resources for everyone on the call today. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, 
one of the things that you were talking about about um, with nurses in particular um, that the requirement that you have found for out of the box thinking and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what helped you with with that to, to get you kind of over the hump it took a lot of digging um, between the HIN and the uh, VMS and figuring out exactly what uh, printing off the expectations on the VMS. There's a couple of places if you uh, folks get a chance to look on the VMS, you can print out the explanations on the ID numbers right down to the exact uh, asthma inhaler medication of what main care wants. That to me is, is critical and it's not easy to find. It does take that time to just pick through and put together. Uh, it, it's a huge puzzle. But uh, out of the box thinking is, is just knowing that we, we can get this done and presenting it to the clients who are receptive. Not all of them are, we know that. But uh, if we show a genuine interest in trying to help them, it, it's received really well, generally. <clears throat> with, with all of your time put into working with Health Internet, you've still come into snags and um, you did mention, I mean, I think all of us who work in technology, uh, you, you know, I was even on an Amazon site the other day, and the buy now button, you know, was there, but not the I changed my mind button. They're, they're always changing things, technology, and you feel, oh, my God, things have changed. Now what do I do? So you had that kind of moment with Health Infonet, and you always think, oh, I'm going to call a technical company, and they're going to do one of those heavy size eye rolling, oh, now what? But that hasn't been your experience. So why don't you talk about that so that everyone on the call knows that when they call Health Infonet, they're not going to get that, um, they're not going to be put down by, on any level. So why don't you talk about your experience? Sure. When I first started in this position, I originally was not getting any notifications that people were going into the ER. And so it took um, some time working with Scott. And I, uh, again, it was, geez, I get to call IT. And the, I am not at all computer savvy. However, <laughs> uh, I, when I called, he was fantastic. He said, you know, let me try to work out a few bugs. Here's my number to get in contact with me if you have any other questions. So, again, it wasn't a 1-800 number. I didn't have to go through uh, automation. I had, a, I had a direct number to get a hold of Scott, and so we were able to uh, work together, and he fixed that problem for me, and I've been off and running ever since. But it's, uh, he was so personable and easy to work with. And it's, I think that's an important story because technology, we don't want that to be the barrier to taking care of your clients. That's not the, that's not the, the goal. No, absolutely, absolutely not. And again, it is critical to follow up with people. If they've been in the hospital or in the ED, that is our, one of our primary goals is to follow up and provide collaborative care. So it afforded me that. Well, thank you so much, Shelley, for sharing with us today some of these um, really key learning lessons that you've taken away and um, some takeaways for everyone, as well as the templates that I think are going to be put into some good use by, by some of the people on our call today. So now we're going to move on. Um, you hear from Liz Mann, who is the Nurse Care Manager at the Opportunity Alliance. Um, she will share best practices on how they've expanded, and all of you on the call did have that same quality project that all of us were part of on the call, but what they have done is they've taken that quality project and expanded it to cover everyone in their behavioral health home. So I'm going to hand this over now to Liz, and first, Liz, if you could tell us a little bit about the behavioral health home structure at TOA. Sure. Can you hear me okay? I can do. That's lovely. Thanks. Great. So um, here in our BHH, as you see on the side, we have two 
clinical coordinators or, or team leads that help um, oversee the program. And um, we have uh, an expanded team now of 20 care coordinators. And so um, we had been providing um, community integration services up until right around the first of the year, um, which they ended then. And so all of our case managers are now care coordinators. So we have 20 um, we also have a few social work interns, and then myself as the sole nurse care manager. And so all of all of us have access to him, and then also um, two full-time peer navigators who do not access him. Okay. And so, um, as Gemma just mentioned, our initial access to him came through that um, that quality project. And so we have started out with a very, you know, kind of a small targeted population um, where we established this protocol and a workflow um, that really emphasized client engagement and education even before an, an emergency room event occurred. Um, also, it emphasized early intervention once that event did happen. Um, communication with the client and their care providers, also medication reconciliation, and then also kind of following the client through um, with any follow-up that was recommended from that visit. And so um, it was a, a protocol that I think was already in practice to some degree, um, but we really just put kind of a structure and a framework around it, um, and it made a lot of sense. Uh, so we decided then to kind of apply that same structure to everyone and not just the, the high utilizers that were identified through that initial project. Mm. All right, next slide. Yeah, and, and you're talking about the care coordinators, how important it was to have that structure. Oh, absolutely. You know, we were very lucky that we have, um, have a lot of care coordinators who started out with the BHH um, as soon as it kind of came to being in 2014. And so by the time this project came around, um, the, the model was, and the philosophy behind the model was very much a part of their work anyway. But for, for newcomers to, to case management in general, this was kind of, you know, um, not the traditional model, obviously. And so I think that um, having that structure and those steps laid out for them um, really helped them to kind of um, um, address the, the needs of the clients as they were working through an emergency room event, but also got them familiar with HIN um, in a way that was very kind of basic. You know, they were told kind of where, where to go to find certain information. Um, and hopefully, you know, that initial um, exposure really helped them to become more comfortable with it, um, and maybe use it more regularly, and then also to use it in more creative ways. So um, I think that was, that was very important to have that structure early on. And can you tell us how many are on your panel? A question just came through on this at TOA. Um, I'm sorry, I, you kind of got interrupted a bit. Oh, how, how, many, how many clients are on your panel for the Behavioral Health Home? Sure. So I think we are right at around 450 at this point. Okay. Thanks. Great. Sure. And um, wanted to talk a little bit to us now about the care managers, the care coordinators, and um, and how they use Health Infonet. Sure. So um, I guess the first thing that I'll mention is that um, integrated care. Um, is not something that's really new to this team. I think the Opportunity Alliance all along in terms of its approach to, to case management has always embraced um, the integrated care coordination approach. And so um, a lot of this work they were doing anyway. Um, so it wasn't a huge change in practice, but it was just kind of maybe putting, like I said, more structure around it or using different terminology. Um, uh, but the benefit to that is that um, they are very comfortable and very competent in um, the kind of the medical and physical health piece. And so as it mentions here, the care coordinators really are the most active responders to the patient notifications. So, um, you know, with a, a, a panel of 450 clients, it's just not realistic for me as the nurse care manager to be responsive to all of those that may come through. Um, so the care coordinators have loaded their entire caseloads into HIN, and they receive those notifications um, about ED and hospital admissions. Um, they also use it on kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis if clients aren't sure if they had a certain test done or what their medications are. Um, 
also, we have an expectation um, here in the in our BHH that there's a, we do a medication reconciliation, um, ideally every three months and with each transition of care. And so being able to access him and have really timely information that goes back for three to four months is really helpful. Um, additionally, we have um, a, a case review that happens every two weeks with our entire kind of multidisciplinary team. And so being able to bring that med list forward to, to that group to review, which includes our, our psychiatric and our medical consultants, that's really helpful as well. Um, so also, one of the ways in which the care coordinators um, use him is when they are reviewing and updating their 90-day um, service plans or treatment plans. And so, you know, an example being if one of the, one of the goals was to um, have more engagement with their care providers, uh, the care coordinator could go back into that encounter history um, and see how many visits they had had over the course of that quarter, um, which is really helpful. Um, Hen also, in terms of troubleshooting with clients, um, they, you know, I can think of a couple of examples that were brought to, to my attention um, somewhat recently. You know, a client thought for sure that she had a lung tumor and was so worried that she hadn't had any follow-up, hadn't had any follow-up. And so, you know, the, the care coordinator looked in Hen to see what, what she could find, brought it to me. We did a little bit deeper digging, um, come to find out that she had had what turned out to be a benign tumor removed um, from, her, from her chest. Um, but that was helpful, you know, without having to, to try and figure out who she may have seen uh, for that particular visit. We were able to tell with the information in, um, in him that the reason why she didn't have any follow-up was because it wasn't necessary, that the, the problem was taken care of and no further follow-up was required. Um, the last bullet here about monitoring medication pickups, I'd actually like to ask Patrice. Uh, she's one of our um, veteran care coordinators. She's here with me right now, um, and I'd like her just to, ex to describe um, a way in which she used TIN recently um, regarding a client's medications that I thought was really, really excellent. So I'll let her kind of just share that here. Um, hi. Um, I was recently doing a med review with a client, and from my previous list, I had a list of about 15 medications that this client was supposed to be taking and what she was reporting taking. Um, when I went on HIN um, to look up, like, okay, you know, when was her last pickup of meds and things like that, um, I had discovered that she had only picked up um, three different medications during the last four months. Um, now, mind you, some of these medications have to do with, um, she's a person who's in um, recovery from breast cancer, so she was on some, some um, chemotherapy pills and, uh, and some pain medication and stuff. So what I did was um, I wrote a letter to each of uh, the, the prescribers of her medication with, and gave them the list of the medications that um, they were prescribing and ask them to update that list for me. Um, so this, I just did this recently, so I've only heard back from one provider right now. Um, and there was actually, like for this specific provider, there was actually um, three medications that she was prescribing, but only one that um, the client was uh, picking up. Um, and so I'm also working with the client on like, you know, what are these, uh, finance, if I know there might be financial barriers for her, um, so how can we help her get her meds and not cause any more financial distress for her? Um, so that's just one example of my, of, you know, using the portal for that. Mm -hmm. A beautiful example, Patrice. Thank you um, for sharing that. And I, I do have, yeah. if you mind, a couple other examples of how I've used the portal. Um, we, we may have time for one. Okay. Well, I just, like, I'll go through the portal and look at current uh, diagnoses that doctors might have for patients, for our clients, and then I'll write a letter to the doctor saying, I understand you're treating this person for this, this, and this. Um, you know, do you have any concerns with her follow-through or treatment in which ways that I can, I can help her, you know, better follow up? And then I also offer information about Liz and how, what Liz's role is along with information about the, um, what our peers can also do for support. 
You know, thank you so much. I think what you're bringing to mind is the importance, and, and we're both on our call today for both Assistance Plus and the Opportunity Alliance, we're really showing the importance of the care coordinator role in the behavioral health home and the importance of the, um, of the, of the care coordinator having access to Health InfoNet and using their psychosocial knowledge about each client to see the bigger story. So Patrice, I'm thinking right now that we're going to have to have a care coordinator call and include you and hear more of the stories. Yeah, I think that would be great because I'd love to hear from other care coordinators throughout the state of how they do it. I think we're so isolated in our practice that we don't get other ideas and ways to do it. Well, we'll see what we can do about, <clears throat> about if we can pull something together like that. Thank you so much for, for jumping on. Um, and it hasn't been easy. Um, we, we do have this slide here. I don't know if I'm able to get to it. Hold on. I'm having a little bit of a, here we go. You'll see it. I wanted to tell a little bit about the cajoling, Liz. Sure. Not, everybody, so, not, not everybody's been on board like Patrice. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, not everyone has been an early adopter like Patrice in a perfect world. Um, we would have a million Patrices running around this place. Um, so yeah, honestly, you know, I think that for our experience has been that just getting into HIN has been the biggest roadblock. And um, you know, sometimes that has to do with the technology. Um, you know, it just not not um, working when the client when the care coordinator has that five minutes right now to see if they can get into HIN. And I'm talking about initially, just signing in for the first time. You've got the issues with their forgotten passwords, and then it, you know. Two weeks may go by before they have the time to um, contact Health InfoNet or RIT, RIT to get at that reset. And so, um, honestly, once folks get into him, I feel like it's kind of footloose and fancy free at that point in time. Um, setting up the notific, you know, setting up the patient list and the subscriptions. That's something that I try to sit with them and walk them through. Um, and again, that can be a pretty significant roadblock to getting those notifications. But you know, once those essential things are taken care of, um, and they're able to get in there and, and use it, um, I feel like the more that they use it, the more helpful they see um, that it is in their care coordination for the client. Then, then the more that they, the more regularly that they use it. Um, I also feel that um, checking email to see those notifications has also been a bit of an issue for us. You know, care coordinators are so busy and they're so mobile. Um, you know, and we've actually we've had to make it pretty clear uh, to some folks that you know checking your email is absolutely essential, particularly since that's the main way that these notifications are are received by us. Um, but you know, it's a slow progress. But I think most of our most of our care coordinators are getting into him pretty regularly at this point. Yeah, and you had mentioned that you've talked about this as integrated care. But moving along to the piece of um, you're the auditor and you're part of um, making sure that um, people have access, and so the barriers. You want to explore the barriers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, <clears throat> so we had to have this auditor function for that initial quality project. And since I have access, I periodically will share um, kind of you know a, a printout of the lookups basically to the to the supervisors to review with their uh, the care coordinators, especially those folks who are not logging into HIN at all or who are not. Um, not using it often um, because it really is an expectation. And so they have that one-on-one -on -one time with their supervisor to really try and troubleshoot, like, why aren't you using this? Do you know that you can, you can see this? Um, you can do this. You can get this information. So um, we, we use that um, as much as we have to to try and get people to, to really get into HIN and see the benefit of using it. Yeah, and, you, and you're, you're very strong that this is coming from you. Oh yeah, um, we, and we we talk about him. I would say at almost every staff meeting that we have, I know that it's talked about in supervision, and so um, we're it's constantly we're constantly putting it in the forefront that this is a really valuable tool that we are lucky enough to have access to um, that we should be using because it truly can benefit the care that our clients receive um, and the communication and collaboration between their their providers. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been a little bit of a, a slog, but I think that we're we're kind of coming, um, we're coming down the other side of the hill now. 
<laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what you do um, at TOA and, and how you meet some of the needs. But before we do, a question did come through, and I just wanted to field that to you. The requirements in the behavioral health home for nurse to patient ratio, is there a requirement that, that you know off the top of your head, the numbers? Uh, no, I've read and reread those um, BHH regulations, and I have not seen specifically specified um, a ratio for nurses. So if anyone actually knows if there is one, I would love to hear it, because to my knowledge, I don't know that there is one. If anyone does, can you put that into chat? That would be terrific. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. And then um, moving on, uh, part of the behavioral health home requirement is um, doing some checking. Can you talk a little bit about the high hemoglobin levels and the antipsychotic prescriptions? Uh, sure, absolutely. So um, this past summer or fall, we were um, sort of in asked to focus in on this high-risk population of um, our clients who are prescribed uh, atypical antipsychotics um, to make sure that they have a hemoglobin A1C performed at least annually because of the uh, risk, the diabetes risk that these clients um, are um, um, are presented with when they're taking these medications. And so um, HIN has been absolutely invaluable in kind of determining who is on antipsychotics and then also in who's prescribing those medications to them um, and also um, if they've had an A1C done. Um, so I um, have kind of developed a system for all of our existing clients and then also as new clients are coming in as well. We don't really just want to limit it to that initial panel of clients that main care sent to us. We want to kind of apply this again, to our entire population. Um, so HIN has been absolutely invaluable. It's kind of one-stop shopping for all of that information. And um, so what we do then is kind of we, we, I share that with the care coordinators, um, and I, I let them know who on their panel is prescribed an, A1, um, an antipsychotic, who the prescriber is, um, and that they need an A1C. That's who they're really focusing in on. Um, and then they take that information back to their clients and really start with the clients and providing education about why this is a focus for us right now um, and really empower them to engage with their, their pre prescriber, whoever's prescribing that medication, and talk about, have I had this test done? Why haven't I had it done? Should I get it done? Um, and then also maybe to have a, a more in-depth discussion around that particular medication um, and whether if they are at increased risk for diabetes, if there's an, alterna uh, an alternative that will help manage their symptoms effectively but also um, not put them um, at such high risk for diabetes. Um, and so this is just another way that I use um, Health InfoNet in sort of monitoring chronic disease. And so I have um, developed a chronic disease registry to identify our clients with these particular chronic conditions or risk factors. Um, and it really developed out of our need to know who our clients are and the, the medical and physical health issues that they are um, dealing with perhaps more often. Um, and so, let's see here, thank you. And so this is just kind of my, my process for when I identify those folks and also um, risk stratifying them. So um, as you can imagine, we have um, quite a few clients who have several physical and mental health comorbidities, and so I kind of set the threshold at three. And so if someone has three or more of those specific comorbidities anyway, then I start my targeted outreach. Um, I share with the care coordinator who I'm outreaching in case they have any information that would be helpful for me. I send an outreach letter to the client. I generally try to follow up. Um, by phone a couple of weeks later just to inquire um, if I haven't heard from them, if they're interested. Um, and what I do is I offer um, my support with chronic disease, self-management, education, um, and, you know, working towards any other physical health goals that they have. And then I also use, you know, in trying to kind of bring everything together, I, I assess for care gaps in the VMS portal, you know, to see if when they've had an LDL or an A1C. And then I also try to align it with the medical goals of their service plan as well. Um, and so, in order to do all of that, um, HIN is, like I said before, it really is a great kind of, um, a great kind of repository for all of this information. Um, and it's been really helpful in um, kind of helping to um, uh, have more information quicker um, in terms of following up on hospitalizations and, and emergency room visits. Um, because of the opioid epidemic, obviously, that is kind of sweeping through this country, we've also decided to um, focus in on our population and get to know better how many of our clients um, 
have had a history of substance uh, misuse or are currently in treatment um, with medication-assisted therapy. And so we use Health InfoNet also to identify those folks as well. And so it's really, it's served a lot of purposes for our program. Um, and I honestly, now that we have it, I don't know what we would do without it. Well, and that kind of um, goes with your quote here. Um, Thank you so much, Liz. I, I do want to tell everyone that thank you, Amanda Seidel. So nice to have you on the call today. I uh, did come back to us with our answer, and I'm just going to read out what Amanda wrote in. There are no ratio requirements for um, nurse to patient ratio, but there were suggestions or recommendations put forth when the behavioral health home was first being formed. Each behavioral health home was given the opportunity to determine which ratios work for them. So I hope that's and that's helpful for everyone on the call. Okay. So um, I want to thank Shelly and Liz. Thank you so much for joining us today and giving us really expert guidance on uh, really improving our own game in the behavioral health home world and um, improving outcomes and care for our clients. Thank you so much. So um, now we're going to move ahead, change of, um, change of topic to Health InfoNet's partnership with um, main care sim year four activities. And for that, I'm going to hand this over to our program director at Health InfoNet, Katie Sense. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, it's been a while since I've talked with many of you, so um, nice to have an opportunity to give you guys some updates today um, related to the sim year four activities. Um, so I'm, I just have a few slides to go through, um, and really what I'm going to review is is at a high level. Um, as you all know, uh, communication um, was released this past Friday or the Friday before. Time has moved so quickly. Um, from from main care related to some new expectations around um, submitting treatment plans. But what we're going to start with is a conversation about um, general prior authorization data. And there's two phases to this. Uh, project um, that we're partnering with Main Care and Kipro on, and the first goal of Phase One is what I'm going to talk about now in our our date for for going live with this initial data set is April 3rd, and then we'll talk about Phase Two, which relates to the treatment plan, which is the email that that had gone out, um, and. There's been a lot of questions that have come in to both Keepro and the Office of Main Care Services um, related to that email, and what is being done is a collection of FAQs, if you will, that everyone will be reviewing and talking about um, and then communicating back out to everyone. Um, but we need a little bit more time to work together to collect all of that information, review the specifics, and then release out um, the statements related to those specific questions. So I will not be addressing any specific questions in, in light of that plan. We want to make sure that there's alignment across main care, health infinite, and Keepro related to all those detailed questions you all have asked. Um, so they're being reviewed, and then we'll, we'll be releasing some information related to those details. Um, so with that said, um, our, our currently, oh, go back, sorry, Gemma, yeah. So currently, um, just so that everyone knows this, this is, has been happening since under the original SIM grant where Health InfoNet receives main care claims data on a monthly um, bulk batch file process. And that information we're able to integrate into the clinical portal um, primarily what is done is the prescription information is integrated with all of the other prescription information we, we receive via the SureScripts connection we have. And so um, that has been ongoing since the original SIM grant year. Um, so what, how we view this partnership in SIM year four is really an expansion to see what other additional data can we receive from main care um, in order to supplement the missing information from all of the behavioral health organizations that are not sharing data with Health InfoNet. And the Office of Main Care and DHHS has been trying to, to work with us to say what, which has led to this offering, which is what data can they be providing um, for the EMRs that are not connected to Health InfoNet as well? And how can we, how can we close this gap? Um, so 
that's the, some of the background. So what is new in SIM Year 4, which is, which is what we're going to be seeing now in April, um, is for Maine Care will be releasing prior authorization data for behavioral health home members only. This is really viewed as a pilot at this point um, to test the waters of how can this um, data connection with Keepro be leveraged um, and for the behavioral health home members in particular, given all of the goals that are around care coordination um, for, this, for this group. Um, the pri this prior authorization data will be available via the current consent processes that you all have. So for those of, for the behavioral health members that are currently connected to Health InfoNet, you have contracts with us, you've been performing consent processes for a long time now, um, or if, if you're new, if you have new behavioral health home members um, or new behavioral health home programs, you are, have been very much involved in more recently in educating your behavioral health home clients on their consent choices with participation in Health InfoNet. And so that prior authorization data is protected under the same consent framework that you're, that you're doing with them now. It is not a new consent framework. It's not an additional consent framework. It's the same one you're already doing. And that's really what um, is, we would consider already in place for you. And what Gemma and I will be doing is fielding any follow-up questions you have about your consent workflow, um, and uh, as well as the FAQ that we'll be working on with Keeper on Main Care. We'll also answer any follow-up questions to this um, webinar that you have. Um, so with that said, we'll go to the next slide. The phase two timeline and goal is to receive behavioral health home treatment plans. And those would not be released and be available in the clinical portal until the date of April 24th. Again, also not available unless the patient has opted in. So it's the same consent um, framework. So uh, we know that the submission of treatment plans or behavior, behavioral health and documentation comes on that 90-day cycle for adults, six months for, for children. So this is, it's not going to be that all of a sudden all of the treatment plans are available. It will be as you are able to submit them to keep row through the new workflow. As that happens, um, they will become available in a rolling, ongoing process going forward as they're submitted, but not before April 24th from a technical perspective. It's just not feasible for Health InfoNet to display them. For many of you, it'll be after April 24th. It'll be at a later date than April 24th. Um, so um, I, I think that just about covers it. I, I do want to point out that part of, I think, a lot of the questions still kind of hanging out there and this needs to get worked on is the workflow related to the fact that we can't display data in the exchange in terms of the treatment plan when it's related to substance abuse and or HIV data. And uh, we know that you're treating whole people, which includes substance abuse and HIV data at times. Um, so these requirements are set forth by main care and Keepro, and they have to follow the law related to those restrictions. And so that's what's really driving that, our legal requirements. Um, so we are supporting um, what main care and keeper are putting forth on that because it is, it is the law is the law and it's really quite uh, black and white. So um, part of the FAQs will be related to questions and concerns that have been come up around that and we'll work really hard to get everyone's questions answered around that. Um, next. Okay, so I've already talked to this a little bit um, about how we are pulling together questions around this, these, some of these new expectations. There is nothing that is different that you, have to, that you have to do in order for the initial phase one of prior authorization data to come into the exchange. There's nothing different about what you're doing um, in relationship to, to Keepro. That data will automatically come in to Health InfoNet and will manage it. What the new workflow is really talking about, and I think um, you know, is where a lot of the FAQs come in is related to the submission of the treatment plan, which is a new workflow for you all in taking data and putting it into Keepro. Um, so um, I think consent has been a big issue of confusion, and we've received lots of questions about that, and that is what we'll be working um, very hard on getting you something soon 
it is under legal review, a lot of the questions as well. So again, bear with us as, as we attempt to address the FAQs that have come in. Um, but I want to be clear that Health InfoNet does not require additional consent or a tracking of consent related to this new um, Keypro data connection. Your current requirements are what they are. We would expect you to keep doing the same, which is providing education to any new behavioral health home members. Um, if there is re-education that needs to happen, we're happy to talk with you about that, support you in that process. Gemma is always available for those types of questions or re-education sessions you might want to do. But it is still the current expectation of, of Health InfoNet consent requirements, nothing above and beyond that. Um, and I also just want to reiterate, I've already talked about, about this, is that this data is protected in the same way that your mental health data already is at Health InfoNet. So the prior authorization data information will not be able to be viewed by other treating providers unless the patient has opted in and given consent for that treating provider to see that information. And I know you all are very well aware of the opt-in forms, the opt-in workflows. You've been trained on that for a long time now where you've gone through new training with your new behavioral health home programs. So where I think a lot of the questions have come up around that is for folks that are not currently connected to Health InfoNet, but they may be a behavioral health home. So we will be working with um, OMS and DHHS around those communications going forward for folks that are currently not participants in, in Health InfoNet and working on how do we handle that. That is not your issue to, um, to worry about or, or a concern. I just wanted to bring it up and make sure that that was really clear. Um, so you all are doing a great job with consent. You've been doing it for a long time and you will continue to do it the way you've been trained by Health InfoNet. And so, um, there's nothing more I really want to say about that. I think that's really it. Um, I know we're close to the top of the hour, um, Gemma. If I, I had been prepared to do a quick demonstration mm -hmm. of what um, we are drafting for how this prior authorization data will be viewed in the clinical portal so people can get a demonstration of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I am happy to do that, but it would I just need, would need you to pass um, presenter mode to me, but we okay. are at the top of the hour too. So I want to. Yeah, we are at the top of the hour, and so just every for every for those of you who cannot stay on the call, this call is getting recorded, so um, you will have access to this um, when we upload it and share that with you. So I'm going yeah. to uh, pass my. I don't <laughs> Oh, sure. Okay, so we do have a question um, before we do that. Um, let's see here. Hold, yeah, a couple questions, actually. So hold on one second. Let me just read these. Um, so, Felicia, I see your question about substance abuse goals and how would these be incorporated into the upload. Um, based on what I've seen, and I, we will be addressing more of these details in the FAQ with Keeper because we really have to take the lead from them on the upload work, workflow, um, is a separate document is being requested. Um, and I think there's some preliminary instructions in the initial email that went out to, to organizations. But um, this will be, I'm sure, in the follow-up um, that a separate document is requested for um, separating out substance abuse goals into a separate plan. Um, so that's the short answer. Um, and then the next question is um, just a concern. Um, okay, so Sue, I, your, um, your question is above my knowledge and understanding. So let, let us do a follow-up to your specific question, and we'll send that out to everyone once we digest it a little bit. So I'll probably have Gemma follow up you specifically on your question. <laughs> okay, Sue, thanks. Okay, so I do know that lots of folks have to drop off the call. Um, what I will do is, con is continue with the demonstration so it's part of the recording, and so folks are welcome to go back and look at that for those that cannot stay. Um, Gemma, before we do that, I will just um, advance um, really quickly. Oh, uh, let's see here. Actually, I'm gonna, thank you. I'm just going to skip ahead here. Um, 
actually, folks, we are going to have to um, postpone the demonstration. So, Gemma, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to do a separate recording of that and have it posted, and then we'll send it out together. Okay. Um, all right. So we we just have run out of time, folks. So I'm sorry about that. Um, we will do a separate recording and then send this out with along with the presentation in today's recording. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I will follow up with all of you. You'll have a recording of the demonstration. Thanks for joining us. Next, uh, next meeting is on May 16th, um, and we look forward to you joining us then. Thanks for joining us today. Bye. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.